special blessing be showered upon all those as they go about their vital mission. Tonight, as always, we ask for direction and guidance and understanding as we act and listen to the various items of business before us, knowing that all, all members of the City Council are here to do what in their best hearts and minds is in the best interest of our community. Uh, we also want to remember those from our community who are sick and infirmed, and we just want to ask that a special blessing be showered upon them for a speedy recover. We ask for all these blessings. Amen. Alderman Brown, would you lead us to the Pledge of Allegiance? The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, moving to item number three, the roll call, please. Brown. Here. Pizzato. Here. Atec. Stark. Here. Chancet. Here. Wolf. Salvati. Here. O'Brien. Here. Callahan. Here. Meitzler. Here. Mueller. Here. Ewer. Here. Cerrone. McFadden. Here. So let the record reflect that we have 11 of the 14 elected officers <coughs> present in the calendar for us. We have the necessary quorum to conduct business. Moving then to item number four, which are items to be removed, added, or changed on the agenda. Alderman McFadden is member of Governmental Services Committee. Would you read this, please? Uh, thank you. I uh, have no, no of nothing that's to be removed or changed. Okay. Anybody else? All right, we will move then to item number five, which is presentation of the consent agenda. And again, Alderman McFadden is a vice chairman of <coughs> governmental services. Would you present this, please? Sure. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, the consent agenda reads as follows. I accept in place on file the Historic Preservation Commission minutes for June 12, 2017, the Plan Commission minutes for May 3, 2017, and the Committee of the Whole minutes for April 11, 2017. <coughs> The approvals are as follows. June 30th, 2017 payroll in the amount of $780,348.35. The accounts payable check register in the amount of $2,355,121.21. The City Council minutes for May 1st, 2017, Part 1, and June 19th, 2017. Ordinance 17 48, dissolving tax increment financing district number two, the junior, junior high redevelopment district. Ordinance 17 43, amending the official zoning map, northwest corner of Millview and Danforth Drives. <coughs> Ordinance 17 44, amending the official zoning map of 2552 Hunt Lane. And Ordinance 17 45, amending the official zoning map, <coughs> Randall Road between McKee and Mills. Wilson Streets. I move we accept the consent agenda as presented. Second. Moved by Alderman McFadden, second by Alderman Ur for the appoint or approval of the consent agenda as presented. Any discussion? Or call the roll. McFadden? Aye. Brown? Aye. Rosado? Aye. Stark? Aye. Chancet? Aye. Salvati? Aye. O'Brien? Aye. Callahan? Aye. Meitzler? Aye. Mueller? Aye. Ewer? Aye. Motion's approved, 11 yes, no, no, three absence. All right, uh, moving to item number six, we are honored this evening, under matters from the public, we are honored this evening to have Kimberly Savall, <coughs> who is the executive director of the Changing Children's World Foundation, and this is a group that has begun some very interesting work within our community, I believe at H.C. Storm School so far and uh, she would just like to make a brief presentation <clears throat> to the council so maybe when you hear about her and her group, you know what they're all about. So Kimberly, welcome and thank you for coming down. Thank you. Wow. I haven't done a dry run, but <laughs> so if I know. How do I get to, ch how do I change the slides? The arrows. Just the arrows, okay. So good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and esteemed council members. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to come and share the story of the Changing Children's Worlds Foundation and to um, share with you the mission of our organization. Not okay. 
apologies. formatting issue. Well, it did show. I mean, the first time I think. Oh, right. It's not a Mac originally, but this is a PowerPoint. But it is saved in PowerPoint, and this one isn't opening at all. Yeah. Um, no. Right. So I also have a, an adapter from the PowerPoint to my computer, so I can play it with my computer okay. with an adapter. <laughs> You don't think that's going to be way at all? Speak loud and watch me. I think it's because it's named .pptx. No? Yeah. Just do that again? Just take off the extension. Okay. Yeah, you're, you're our tech guy, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's been outed. <laughs> 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 City equipment. No, yeah, right. It's the, the Max. So it's the, like, it, hey. Oh, great. <laughs> What's that? Thank you. Very very much. This is your doing, isn't it? You've got Mac fear. Just relax. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to begin again. <laughs> so, good evening. Thank you for allowing me to be here with you to share the story of the Changing Children's Worlds Foundation. Um, and also our mission. And this is our mission in Batavia, the Fox Valley, Chicago, and beyond. For every child and adolescent to have a strong network of adult caregivers and professionals engaged in supporting their positive development, nonviolent families, and peaceful communities. I am a Batavia resident, and I've worked with nonprofit organizations, especially in the area of child protection, for over 30 years. Um, for 14 years, I was the executive director of the International Society for the Prevention of Child Abuse and Neglect. Um, our interdisciplinary membership organization worked in over 180 countries around the world. The, um, during my time there, in my experience, I worked, I was on the task force of a UN committee 
um, to the uh, UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And in my experience working with interdisciplinary professionals in law, law enforcement, um, medic medicine, mental health, education, social services, um, what I learned was that the problems of child abuse and neglect, the impact of violence against children are severe not only for the immediate victims and their families, but also for generations to come, for their children and their children's children. And for that reason, it's so important for us to invest in prevention. And in fact, the best prevention we can invest in is actually promotion, universal approach to promotion of positive development and well-being. So our organization um, works with parents. And you can see the long list. And I've let it stay up there as, as I've spoken, because it's a very long list. Um, our program doesn't focus on special needs populations. Our program is for all parents, because all parents can use the support of, um, of supportive communities in raising their children. We know that when children lack love, attention, guidance, and support to succeed, they risk becoming juvenile and then adult offenders. What if we could cost effectively support them to succeed by supporting them and their parents and their families? Because the issue of child abuse and neglect and how to support victims is so extensive and so expensive, our limited resources do not extend often beyond promotion of well-being and achieve prevention, for, especially for families at risk. Yet this is the only strategy which will help children to never experience the trauma of abuse and violence. I left the International Society for Prevention of Child Abuse and Neglect because it did not focus sufficiently on prevention. We worked tirelessly on intervention Victim after victim after victim. Do you know about the adverse childhood experiences? These are experiences that children have during their early lives that stay with them. You might not have heard about the term ACEs, but you certainly know those children in our community. 60% of American children were exposed to violence, crime, or abuse in their homes, schools, and communities. Children exposed to violence are more likely to suffer from depression, anxiety, post-traumatic disorders, fail or have difficulty in school, abuse drugs and alcohol, become delinquent and engage in criminal behavior. In fact, more than 50% of adolescents have had at least one ACE in their lifetime, and nearly one in 10 have had four. Youth who experience four or more adverse childhood experiences are at higher risk to have long-term, often lifetime health issues. So when we talk about prevention, it's a really important thing for the personal cost of the individual, child, and family, but also because of the social cost that we can redirect towards positive development in our population. So we created the Changing Children's Worlds Foundation in Geneva to serve Kane County and also Chicago because positive development and prevention of violence and aggression in families must be supported by each community. We know that the investment in parenting education holds the promise to break the intergenerational transmission of outcomes such as child abuse, school failure, violence, mass incarceration, and family instability. Well, yesterday was the 4th of July. Maybe some of you saw the Brookings article that stated, the American dream is not about guaranteed outcomes, but about the pursuit of opportunities. If we can help families be strong, healthy, hopeful, make positive con contributions to society, and have opportunities to pursue, then we can avoid the personal injury and the social costs we incur as a community when we do not protect our children from physical, sexual, psychological abuse, neglect, or even exposure to domestic violence. This is the investment in training that we have for our program. 
We train and invest in facilitators of our program in every community, every school community. Why don't some communities make that investment? Sometimes it's because we're, we see the urgency of the victim and the urgency of intervening when someone has been exposed to violence. However, all of us can use some positive support in many of the areas of parenting and family relationship. These are the areas we focus on, parent empathy, parent efficacy, being able to really support our children in, in many different areas. Um, our ICDP guidelines focus from social emotional learning to helping our children's cognitive development to regulation, self-regulation, as well as positive discipline. Regulation, we know when kids go to school, they have a better chance of, of succeeding in school if they've had positive regulation in their home. We also see in our evaluation results an impact in terms of the parents' perceived uh, positive mental health from pre to post evaluation in their perception of their own well-being. So in Batavia, and I've lived in Batavia for 23 years, raised a family and loved it here. Batavia, I know, is a wonderful community to live in. But here, with working together, we could make our community one of the healthiest anywhere in the state, in the nation, in the world, in terms of physical and mental health, connectedness, and positive social relationships, purpose, and hope. How? Well, this is the business of the Changing Children's Worlds Foundation. And this is what I believe is the business and hope is the business of the Batavia City Council. In fact, we build community to raise the capacity, confidence, and caring levels beyond empathy-based parenting to caring within community. So here's my Batavia update. In Batavia, in 2016, with Tri-City Family Services, we held our first program at the H.C. Storm Elementary <laughs> School with funding from the Batavia Mothers Club. Um, we now have funding for the second year, and we hope to invite more parents from the Louise uh, White Elementary School, although we didn't get sufficient funding to actually hold a, a second full program. This is what we're doing so far. And what does the program look like that we offer? It's an interactive, respectful, uh, community development with peer facilitation by professionals and parent leaders. Um, our parents join in, in conversation and discussion. They support one another as we go through hard times, as we go through good times. And the results are re positive resilience in our children, resilience that, um, are, that are developed by personalized responsiveness when parents really understand their children and know their children, scaffolding protection of their children buffering their children from developmental disruption, and helping their children to build key capacities that will help them in life. Ability to plan, monitor, regulate their own behavior, ability to adapt to changing circumstances. And when we help give them the positive experiences and relationships, we are helping them to be able in the future to respond to adversity and thrive. We use an international evidence-based interactive curriculum developed in Norway, Sweden, and England, which is supported, I learned about it, through World Health Organization and UNICEF. And the results basically are, we improve parents' empathy and understanding of their children for more effective, positive parenting, parents' capacity to deal with the pressures of parenting constructively, more effective, positive parenting, um, and reduced per, uh, perception of child conduct difficulties and parental depression, parents' ability to self, to set boundaries and discipline, parents' ability to play and enjoy family time, as well as parents' positive perceptions of their own physical, mental, and well-being and quality of life towards a greater chance for children to thrive academically and socially. That's our goals. So who? Who benefits from this program? These parents are our neighbors, and they are us. You may recognize some of them here at the H.C. Storm School. Batavia has great schools, great teachers, professionals, and families. The good news is that ICDP could be at every Batavia preschool and elementary school in the next year or two. We could build community while we build families. 
while we support children's maximum positive development. Is the Batavia City Council in? So our theme, our educational theme is every parent, every child, a superhero with commitment. We can do so much. Um, we have materials that we've shared with you, annual reports, other materials, um, and our QUIF board member, uh, Colonel Jake Wyatt, is here. Either of us would be happy to answer any questions. We do have a, a training workshop for facilitators who are interested in building this program further in Batavia, um, and we have some of those flyers uh, with us as well. Uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. Any questions? I invited uh, Kimberly and Jake to come today because I had met with them and I know they were, they were looking to get their message out and I explained where we're on TV here. So this is one good way to get you out into the community and let other groups see you. And certainly uh, Batavia's cable franchise goes to all the rural parts of Kane County. We're the, we're the provider for that. So this takes you into all the western part of the county, if nothing else. So Thank you. hopefully we got you some good, decent exposure here. Uh, certainly we'll, we'll be watching with great interest as your program develops in the community and thank you for all that you're trying to do and will do and uh, you are certainly in a challenging arena in this community because certainly if you and all these aldermen get a copy of the police activities if they want to read it on a daily basis and I think many of them do and are aware of the amount of this type of issue that we face here on an ongoing basis on a daily basis with parents with children that they're having problems with and vice versa. And so it's, it is certainly one, one thing that is a paramount issue of concern in Batavia. So I think you're on the right track here and we wish you the very best in the days ahead. And I'm sure we'll hear from you again soon. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very right. much. Just one quick question. Do you have an email address? Yes, I have it. I have a card. I can give you a card. Well, I think you'd like to have her say it on the TV. Is that what? Sure. Ah, okay. So it's Kimberly at gmail.com, or I'm sorry, it's Kimberly at changingchildrensworlds.org. So Kimberly, K I M B E R L Y at changingchildrensworlds.org. And do you, do you have an, like an office phone number? That yes, you, yes. You put that out so that everybody could have that too? Thank you, yes. 630-909-9411. Good. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, the next thing then is the Batavia Chamber <coughs> of Commerce report and we're very honored to have Holly Dykeman, the executive director here. I have no technology today, I just have paper. Um, so hopefully this will go quickly. But first of all, I just wanted to thank so many of you. I saw you working as volunteers for the fireworks or the sky concert last night. Um, awesome, just presentation of how our community comes together through volunteerism, donations, sponsorships, whatever, to put on such an awesome celebration of what I believe we experience in our lives here in Batavia. So thank you. Um, and I couldn't believe how many police officers and servicemen that there were there um, directing everybody on where to go leaving that, because that is a zoo getting out of there. Um, but seem to be flawless because they've got that route really figured out now. So thank you for that. I thought I would be smart and running out and getting into my car and then I just sat in my car. But uh, once we started going, it was all very smooth. So thank you all for all the efforts that it took to put that uh, event together. Um, Windmill City Fest is coming next weekend, July 14th through the 16th here in Batavia, right outside of our windows here. The chamber will have a special mixer on the Friday evening from 6 until 8 p.m. So if you want to come and see some local business owners, come and uh, spend some time with them. Of course, the bands will already be playing and the beer will be flowing through the beer tent. So uh, join us and have some great conversation with local businesses. On July 29th, our chili cook-off, and hopefully it'll be a nice hot day here in Batavia to eat some chili. Uh, I don't know why it's always in the summer, but it is. And so we're happy to be partnering again with the Batavia Park District to bring you uh, the chili cook-off. 
tasting spoons will be available for $5 per person. Uh, but we, if you would like to get free chili, you can sign up to be a judge. So let me know. You can send me an email, uh, and you can be a judge for the day, uh, testing a bunch of championship chili. That, again, is on July 29th from 2 until 4 p.m. down here at the Riverwalk. Um, a couple of other events we have coming up. We have a ribbon cutting on July 21st at 7.30 a.m. for Talk of the Town Toastmasters. They meet uh, on those mornings at 7.30 a.m. and they're super great people and I hope you can come out at 7.30 a.m. to say hello to them. Um, and we also have the, on August 3rd, the ribbon cutting for uh, Joe Cosner. It's actually a celebration of his longtime business here as an um, American family insurance agent right here on Wilson Street. And that will be at 4 p.m. on August 3rd. Um, we are now taking the reason why, um, one of the many reasons why I was at the Sky Concert last night is we were taking pre-orders for the Batavia Apoly game. So if you are looking to pre-order a game, please let me know. We will be, I will be at the Farmer's Market this Saturday again with our tent, uh, taking more pre-orders. And we will also have a booth on Saturday and Sunday at Windmill City Fest, so you can always stop in and pre-order there. We're very excited about the game. We've already sold over 250 of the seven 750 games that we are planning to produce. Um, so make sure that you put in your pre-order. We would consider even bumping up the total uh, production to maybe a thousand um, if the pre-orders continue at the same pace they are to date. So um, we're very excited about it. We've heard great feedback from the community um, and people are really excited about playing the game for the first time. So. Um, other than that, I don't have too much else to thank you all for besides your amazing support as always. Um, but I have a new, well, not a new business owner, but a new member of the Batavia Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> Her name is Dawn Mills, and she is the owner of Wolf Wash, longtime business here in Batavia, but new member to the chamber. So please welcome up to the podium, Dawn Mills. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council, and community members. Thank you for having me here tonight. My name is Dawn Mills, and I am the proud owner of Wolf Wash Dog Grooming Shop and Self Service. Thank you for asking me to share a little bit about my business. We're located at 137 South Batavia Avenue, um, just north of Main Street, and minutes away from the Fox River Trail to the east and neighborhoods to the west. Our phone number is 630-879-1896. Wolf Wash provides professional grooming as well as a self-service dog wash. Professional grooming includes everything from nose to tail. It is our goal to provide a groom that meets our clients' needs and fits into their lifestyles. We also provide in-between -groom, in groom spruce ups, nail trims, dremels. We trim the little faces up for, so they can see. And we provide many quality shampoos and conditioners for every fur and skin type as well as flea, de-skunk, and medicated shampoos. Self-service has everything that you need to wash your own pet. We have two different shampoos for two different skin types. We have a tearless shampoo for around the eyes, my own special homemade organic ear cleaner. We have towels, blow dryers, uh, brushes. Um, I started working at, at Wolf Wash at the beginning of January 1998. I was 36 years old at that time. I had been grooming for dogs for 17 years by then. I purchased Wolf Wash three years and four months later. I fell in love with the charm and the lovely people of Batavia. Um, I noticed the most impressive thing was it's very welcoming and you get a sense of belonging to this community. And when the economy collapsed, the building that Wolf Wash is housed as lease in went into foreclosure. Um, I hung in there, I had faith in my will, my business, and my talent, and I have great customers. And um, I knew things that, that they would get event better eventually, and they did. And uh, Mark and Jennifer Bosser purchased the building and bought it, brought it up to code and made it really nice again. 
Through the years of the building's foreclosure, I experienced phone line problems, electrical problems, subflooring problems, but they came in and they fixed everything. And I also expressed that my, my shop had become run down through the years and we struck a financial deal and spent many hours together on fixing up the shop. And <laughs> Jennifer's skill in decorating is amazing. And um, I can't express the feeling I get when customers new and old walk in the shop and say, wow, this is beautiful. And I'm forever grateful to Jennifer, Mark, and the highly talented BZ. Wolf Wash employs three to five people. Currently, I have the privilege of working with a team of four. Wolf Wash demands a love for dogs with strong work ethic, sorry, and a great attitude. We are a team. I am presently looking for another person of that description. Wolf Wash has relied solely on word of mouth advertising, but I am in the process of finding someone to help me update my website and fix my Facebook page. But you can find us on Facebook. Um, if anyone has suggestions, please contact me at Wolf Wash. I would like to stay within the community. As of yet, we do not do retail, and that is going to change. My plan is to network with local art artisans, photographers, and such. I'm very excited to add this element for my clients. I have a great passion and love for what I do. Wolf Wash is my baby. I am projecting this year and many more to come that, they will, that Wolf Wash will be a reputable and stable part of this community. And I'm looking forward to continuing to give the extraordinary services and adding additional offerings to my client. I feel honored and privileged to be a part of this community. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to respond. Any questions? Okay. Well, thank you for your time this evening. It was truly an honor. Okay. Well, before you, can you give us, did, did you give us your phone <coughs> number and your, e your email address? Um, well, you're still working on that. I don't really, I mean, I, I have my personal email address, but um, with this kind of business, I would prefer to speak to the people. Okay. And, you know, get what they need for their dog is very difficult through text and email, but on social media with the Facebook, I have a really big following on that. I mean, I'm just thinking that somebody may be watching this on TV. And oh, yes, I did give my phone number. Okay. Do you want me to give it again? Yeah, would you please? Sure. It's 630-879-1896. Okay. Very good. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. And Holly, could you maybe come back up for just a second? Uh, reference uh, Windmill City Days. Uh, we're going to have, obviously, the tent out here, as we always do. Mm -hmm. But we're changing kind of what we're doing with Houston Street, aren't we, a little bit? Absolutely. So the park district was in a contract with Windmill City Amusements or whatever they're called. <coughs> and, um, they, through their contract, the park district only works with people that do criminal background checks, and the company was not willing to do that for us. So we got out of that contract with them. Um, because, of course, we only want the safest um, atmosphere for our kids. And so they um, decided to get rid of the all of the different rides and stuff. And now this year, all along Houston is going to be um, inflatables. So, But they have like the big slingshot thing and um, other different kind of mazes and stuff like that. So the park district is basically running it this year and it should be super fun. They're actually going to um, expand the beer um, containment area or alcohol containment area um, to be to the far south side of Houston Street. So it'll be, you can go in there and you're, the adults can be tasting a beverage while their kids are bouncing on the inflatables. And so that's kind of a new thing for this year. We also have two food trucks that will be kind of <coughs> on Houston Street in between some of the inflatables. So um, the kids can buy stuff from Andre's. They'll have their food truck out there. And also um, Susan's favorite donut truck, the little red donut truck, um, will be out there. So you'll have some opportunity to also um, get some treats while you are uh, around them as well. So we'll have tons of food vendors like usual and some local, some from out of state and should be still a great event. So the reason, one reason I wanted you to come back up today, I got a call from a gentleman who wanted to know, was the chamber going to have the booths available for people to rent on Saturday morning so they could sell their wares or their ideas or 
So that actually is run through the um, Depot Museum, handles the market section of it, the antique market um, and craft fair, which will still be uh, on the north side um, behind the Peg Bond Center. Well, he, I, you know, he was claiming he wasn't sure what was happening, so I told him to call you. So I gave him your number, the office number. That was probably the two hangups I got today, so. It probably was, but <laughs> they, were, they called me and wanted to know where you're doing it, because he was going on about the Carver Group has a table or something up there, and they do real well mm -hmm. there, and he wanted to bring his stuff in and do some other things, so. Yep, so that is still gonna be a part. I think it's actually the hours of that have expanded <laughs> for this year, so there's still gonna be the huge uh, market, again, just on the north side of Pegmon Center. Okay, Mayor? any questions of Holly? If I could, I just wanted to mention that the bike path will be diverted to the um, south sidewalk of Houston Street, so that if you're coming off the bike path and you wanna hook up here with the footbridge, you'll just go along the south sidewalk of Houston Street. We're gonna have some sign or something telling people to do that? Yes. Yep. There's gonna be, um, they've already ordered a bunch of uh, signage to put along that uh, beverage containment area so that people know to divert to that south uh, sidewalk. Okay, very good. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving to item number eight, which is resolution 17-82-R, authorizing execution of an amended and restated Intergovernmental Agreement for Tri-City Ambulance. Who's got Alderman McFadden, do you have this? I do, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, <clears throat> so Tri-City Ambulance Service was formed with an inter in 1985 with an inter intergovernmental agreement. And today, uh, members include St. Charles, the City of Batavia, City of Geneva, Geneva Township, Batavia, and Countryside Fire Protection District. And they all participate in the Tri-City Ambulance Services. <coughs> Recently, Tri-City became one of the only ambulance agencies in Illinois to receive national accreditation for providing outstanding emergency response service. On, in February, uh, Lieutenant Governor Evelyn Sanguinetti recognized Tri-City Ambulance as an example of communities working together to bring the best emergency medical services to their citizens. The current agreement uh, is due to expire on July uh, 31st of this year, and in June uh, of this year, the Tri-City Ambulance Board met and unanimously approved an amended and restated intergovernmental agreement. Um, the proportioned share of the cost hasn't changed from the last agreement, uh, but there are a couple of changes in the new agreement, uh, including the composition of the board, which will be composed of seven members, two from each of the original legacy members, and one uh, <coughs> representing all non-legacy members. Uh, it also gives the Tri-City Board of Directors, uh, they're authorized to approve contracts and for goods and services in excess of $10,000. Uh, previously, this would have required ratification from each member's city council. Uh, that was not a legal requirement, uh, and the Tri-City auditors uh, recommended the change as an, approved to, uh, as an improvement to operations. Also, uh, it was determined the reserve should be maintained at a level of three months of operating expenses, plus the amount necessary to purchase an additional ambulance. And uh, the last change uh, governs, uh, talks about if a party wishes to withdraw from the agreement, um, they'll receive from Tri-City 75% of its share of the reserve funds. Um, and then the same percentage share is its share of the budget. Um, <clears throat> and staff is recommending the approval of this ordinance. Any questions? It certainly comes with, the re you know, I serve as chairman of this body, and Alderman Wolf represents this as the other member on the, representing Batavia, and I know he and I certainly support what we're trying to do here. We need to kind of clean this up and renew it, because as you said, it, it's going to expire on July 31st, and we want to have this all set in place in case we have anybody else that wants to kind of come back to us or visit us or ask about becoming members we wanted to make sure that those who originally started it and set it up and have been paying for all these years are still totally in control over it so that's the purpose for the agreement all right um, 
I'll make a motion we approve resolution 17-82R authorizing the execution of amended and restated intergovernmental agreement with Tri-City Ambulance. Second. Second. Moved by Alderman McFadden, second by Alderman Silvati for the approval of the amended Tri-City Ambulance Intergovernmental Agreement. Any further discussion? Kirk, call the roll. McFadden? Aye. Brown? Aye. Rosado? Aye. Stark? Aye. Jansett? Aye. Silvati? Aye. O'Brien? Aye. Callahan? Aye. Meitzler? Aye. Mueller? Aye. Ewer? Aye. Resolution 17-82-R is approved 11 yes, no no's, three absent. Moving item number nine, which is approval of a Class D-1 liquor license for Rosati's Pizza. <coughs> Alderman McFadden, this is your night. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, all right, this is, uh, as the mayor stated, a liquor license for uh, Rosati's Pizza. This is to go along in conjunction with their planned expansion. Uh, we discussed it at a previous COW. Um, the ordinance, uh, this, uh, this approval is contingent on a couple of things, copy of a signed lease for the property and a copy of a site diagram for the business. Uh, assuming those things come in, uh, we, we can approve the license. It's been through all the necessary background checks. Um, is there any discussion on that one? Well, I mean, I think the r rule is we don't issue the license until we have all the documents, but right. the council wants to go ahead and give it to us. Once they get this, <laughs> these folks are in a hurry, and once they get it all together, they want to get themselves organized so they can get the door open. So as long as we have the approval of the city council, I can go ahead and sign the license once we have all the documents. It's kind of the way this is working. All right, I'll make a motion we approve. Uh, the Class D1 liquor license for Rosati's Pizza and the conditions of receiving a copy of signed lease from the property and a copy of the site diagram for the business. Second. Motion by Alderman McFadden, second by Alderman Mueller for the approval of uh, the Class D1 license for Rosati's <coughs> on East Wilson Street. Any discussion? Kirk, call the roll. McFadden? Aye. Brown? Aye. Rosado? Aye. Stark? Aye. Chancet? Aye. Salvati? Aye. O'Brien? Aye. Callahan? Aye. Meitzler? Aye. Mueller? Aye. Ewer? Aye. Motion's approved. 11 yes, no no's, three absent. Moving to item number 10, which is approval of Class D1 license, liquor license for hot pans. Alderman McFed. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, as stated, liquor license for hot pan noodles. They've been in and talked to us, have been through all the necessary background checks. Um, and there's no contingency. I'll make a motion. We approve the Class D1 liquor license for hot pan noodles. Second. Moved by Alderman McFadden, second by Alderman Mueller for the approval of the Class D liquor license for hot pans on West Wilson Street. Any discussion? Or call the roll. McFadden? Aye. Brown? Aye. Rosado? Aye. Stark? Aye. Chancet? Aye. Salvati? Aye. O'Brien? Aye. Callahan? Aye. Meitzler? Aye. Mueller? Aye. Ewer? Aye. Class D1 liquor license for hot pans is approved 11 yes, no no's, three absent. Moving to item number 11, which is Class D1 liquor license for Aliano's Restaurant. Alderman McFadden. Thank you, Your Honor. This is the liquor license for Aliano's. It's under new ownership. The new owners are requesting the license. Uh, they've been through the, all the background checks and have passed those. Uh, the request is contingent on us receiving a copy of a signed lease agreement for the property, copy of the site diagram for the business, copies of Bassett certifications for Banu and Danish Aslam, and a copy of certificate of liability and dram shop insurance. Uh, I go ahead and make a motion. We uh, approve the license uh, per the uh, contingencies as stated. Alderman, if I could also add that all four of these documents have subsequently come in, so they are compliant. Yeah. We just Fabulous. got those today. And, and yes, that's correct. Yeah. So we do have them all. Thank, Thank you. you. Moved by Alderman McFadden, second by Alderman Mueller for the approval of the uh, D1 license for Aliano's restaurant at the corner of uh, South uh, North Island Avenue and Houston Street. Any discussion? Kirk, call the roll. McFadden? Aye. Brown? Aye. Rosado? Aye. Stark? Aye. Aye. Chancet? Aye. 
Salvati? Aye. O'Brien? Aye. Callahan? Aye. Weitzler? Aye. Mueller? Aye. Ewer? Aye. Class D1 license for Alianos is approved. 11 yes, no no's, three absent. Moving item number 12, which is approval of a Class F liquor license for the Batavia Community Table Dinner. Alderman McFadden. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes, this would be a one-day temporary outdoor Class F license for the Batavia Community River Event or Community Dinner Event that's held on River Street on S Sunday, August 6th. Um, Go ahead and make a motion. We approve that Class F license for the Batavia Community Dinner Event. Second. Moved by Alderman McFadden. Second by Alderman Ur for the approval of the Class F liquor license for the Batavia Community Dinner Table. Any discussion? It's a great event last year. If you're not doing anything, I'd encourage you to go. Uh, Kirk called the roll. McFadden? Aye. Brown? Aye. Rosado? Aye. Stark? Aye. Chancet? Aye. Salvati? Aye. O'Brien? Aye. Callahan? Aye. Meitzler? Aye. Bueller? Aye. Ewer? Aye. Class F liquor license for the Batavia Community Dinner Table is approved. 11 yes, no no's, three absent. Moving to 13, the administrator. <coughs> Good evening. It's really great to hear all of the business activity that we have going on in our community. And I also wanted to share a, a couple of other uh, businesses that are going to be opening up in our community soon, applications which have been received by the Community Development Department for Denny's, who is going to take over at the uh, Honey Jam Cafe, previous Honey Jam Cafe location. We'll welcome them into Batavia. And then also Sierra Trading Company, who will be located in the Circuit City, previous Circuit City location. They're not taking uh, quite all of that space, but we're really excited to have a new re retailer come to our community. Um, also wanted to let people know about future brush pickup dates. Um, those would be uh, July 10th, the week of July 10th for the east side, and the week of July 17th for the west side. And as always, you want to have your items out to the curb by 7 o'clock a.m. on that Monday so that they can be picked up during the week. And just a reminder that with the holiday, the garbage pickup for this week is going to be a day later. Um, I wanted to um, alert people just about some things having to do with the Committee of the Whole meeting for next week, which is on July 11th, that the start time for that will be 630 p.m. and it will begin with a uh, tour of Wilson Street. Um, at that time, we expect to be able to see the um, Spintronic sculpture in place, which is expected to be installed um, this Friday, so two days from now. And um, Bill McGrath is meeting with the sculptor of the other bridge piece for the science bridge piece and we should have an installation date on that soon. The, um, the uh, metal material for the um, store henge project was at the fabricators last week and should be at the printers this week. So that is moving forward. Um, wanted to let you know that there's uh, the request for proposal for the strategic planning um, facilitator, those RFPs are due this coming Friday. And so then we will begin the task of reviewing the proposals that have been received. But I have been contacted by at least a half a dozen firms who would like to work with us on this <coughs> project. Um, I also wanted to mention at the next Committee of the Whole meeting on the agenda is a discussion of the Batavia Avenue pedestrian crossings. Um, as many of you know and, and saw in the news that there, were, uh, there was an accident at the crossing not too long ago. Um, one of the first things that we did was the communication coordinator is working with BATV for the production of a safe crossings video that addressed not only those um, on Batavia Avenue with the yellow flashing crossing, but also the, um, the ones that do not have the flash crossing that are on Wilson Street, so that it's just a reminder of everybody how to utilize those crossings safely. But the discussion next week at the Committee of the Whole is going to focus on the future 
of uh, those crossings. We will review the experience that we have had with them thus far. Um, as you know, um, in, from previous meetings, the uh, staff was, um, was interested in pursuing to see if we could get what's called a hawk signal there with the red flashing at the crossing as opposed to yellow flashing. Those are not allowed in our particular district by Illinois Department of Transportation. However, staff did meet last fall with the Illinois Department of Transportation to have a conversation about that. So that will be part of our discussion next week as well. But we'll pre present the several options and certainly any member of the public who would like to um, share their opinion about the safety of the crossings and what is best to do there is welcome to attend that meeting. Um, that's all I have unless somebody has a, a question about anything in particular. Any questions? I would just like to note that uh, I've had some members of the council ask me rather recently what we're going to do with the two bulldogs that are sitting on the bridge when those come out. And I've assured everybody that we are going to find some other prominent visible home for those two respective art pieces, I guess mm -hmm. I will call them. And uh, there's a lot of people that have a passion or an interest. To, Bulldog that's painted to look like he's made out of limestone is a particular favorite, apparently, of a number of people that have interest in that. So I just, I don't know if you have some particular idea of some place that you think it may be a good place to show it, secure it, uh, I think we'd be interested to know. But there's a lot of ideas being kicked around by several people as to where those dogs should go. But I think the idea is we want to keep them in the community portrait in the part of the town so people can see them and appreciate them. And uh, several people have told me that they've got, they've started a thing where they take their, what were small children and they take them down there and either put them on top of them or stand on them or something. And they're doing yearly family pictures with those dogs. So uh, you never know what you're gonna start with when you do stuff, but that's, we have a dog fan club. On. <laughs> so, uh, one, ni one nice idea in that regard, uh, Mayor, might be to um, put a post up on Facebook to solicit um, people's suggestions about potential um, areas of where to, to place that in the community, and then we can tabulate that and share that information with council as they make their decision on where to place them. Alderman Callahan, do you have a comment? Just a quick question about uh, the Sierra Trading Company with, especially with um, Gander Mountain leaving and Camping World not going in there, that's a great win for us. Do we know when that's going to be opening? Scott? We don't have an opening date yet uh, for that. There's, they still have some uh, facade improvements they're going to do as part of the uh, project, but uh, we do not have a specific opening date, but I assume it's going to be late summer or early fall. As I remember, um, they for sure wanted to be able to open for Black Friday this year. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You want to give us a bird report on our tree over here, too? Yes, I do. <laughs> um, our talented electric department probably never thought that they would be putting this on their resume, but they, um, they studied other successful um, examples of an artificial perch for corm cormorants. There are quite a number of communities that due to the deterioration of the trees in which cormorants and other birds of the same nature had perched and um, they wanted to find an alternative to make sure to maintain that community of birds in the same place. And so um, Brian Bettine and the electric department formulated a plan for the electric pole with um, three perches which needed to be offset from one another because the birds don't want to sit one on top of one another. And um, we've seen some interested cormorants. One brave soul flew over there last week and spent a few minutes over there. And I think he might be the same one who sits on a separate branch of the dead tree and eyes very carefully his new home. So we're um, slowly watching as the birds adapt to using that new perch before we take down the old tree. Um, but we feel pretty confident that that's gonna keep them 
there. The reason being, it's dinner time right below them. There is a plentiful population of fish below that area. That was the original draw for them deciding to perch there. So if we give them something um, reasonable for them to perch on to hunt from there, then they will. And as long as we're talking about trees next to the river, uh, we had a tree fall into the Fox River right behind the Public Works building a week ago yesterday. And uh, I've asked, Laura and I went down and looked at it the other day, and I've asked her to have the staff uh, take what steps are necessary to get that tree removed out of the river. I took the city arborist down there and had him look at it, and he noted that one of the things that's going on there is, is that with this uh, temporary deposit of, of rock that's north of the island, we are artificially diverting the river's flow toward the west bank of the river. And that, that side of the river is under tremendous pressure, especially when the height of the river has been going up the last few weeks with all the rain we've had. And it's washed away a lot of the undergrowth of that tree so that the tree roots really had nothing to stand on. And eventually the whole thing just went right into the river. It's quite sightly if you look at it from the Wilson Street Bridge and you know it really kind of throws a sore point onto our efforts to clean up the riverbank, but it's going to get taken out of there pretty quickly. So I just wanted you all to know that that, that is being worked on. Anybody, anything else for her? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Going to committee reports, community development, Alderman Brown. Thank you, Your Honor. Historic preservation schedule for this coming Monday has been canceled. The next committee of the whole, as our city administrator just mentioned, is this coming Tuesday the 11th at 6.30. Other than the items that she mentioned, I know of nothing else on the agenda at this time. Um, plan commission is scheduled for Wednesday, July 12th at 7 o'clock, and that's all I have. Uh, government services, Alderman McFadden. Thank you. I have nothing to report tonight, Your Honor. Do we have anything under city services tonight? With the absence of Alderman Wolf, who's, I forget who's vice chairman. Marty. Oh, Marty. I don't believe we have anything either. Okay. And public utilities? Uh, nothing, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, going to other, anybody have any other business? Alderman Stark. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I want to thank everyone who came out um, to the fireworks last night. Um, the chair of our committee, uh, Mark Davis, who's also the head of ESDA in Batavia, asked me to share a few things um, to clear up some, um, just some things that happened at the fireworks. Um, first of all, the porta potties were not purposely placed all at one end of the um, at Engstrom Park to make it a long walk for everyone who was over near the high school. Um, we communicated with the porta potty company via email, telephone. Uh, we sent them a map and said we want half where they were placed and half over by the high school. And unfortunately, they didn't do that. And by the time we realized it, they were closed for the holiday, and so there was no one to move them. And since they're privately owned, it's not like we could have public works or anyone shift them. So unfortunately, people did have to walk. But the plan is for next year, they will go back to being in two different places so that um, people don't have to um, walk all the way to the end of Engstrom to get to the porta potties. So that was one major conundrum, and um, it was commented on by many people at fireworks last night and then again today and social media. Um, second, um, people talked about the sound and how we must have done something to change the sound because they couldn't hear it in areas that they always sat. Um, unusually, last night, um, the wind was blowing from a different direction, which was terrific for the fireworks viewers because the fireworks smoke blew away from the people and blew away from the fireworks. So we had a crystal clear night to see the fireworks and it was terrific. Unlike last year where the smoke hung over everyone, um, the wind was blowing in, um, last night it was blowing out. Unfortunately, it also blew the sound out. So people who were sitting in places that they've sat in for years who couldn't hear the music, we had it cranked the same decibel, we had it the speakers positioned in exactly the same place, but unfortunately the wind didn't cooperate. And so that's why you didn't get to hear um, the music as loudly as you would have supposed. Um, the stage was in exactly the same place. The stage, in terms of um, direction, it always faces due um, east on uh, Millview. 
And so that had nothing to do with the sound. That was, a, again, just a, a total fluke. Um, and the same thing with the positioning of the fireworks. Some people had commented that they thought we shot the fireworks off further away. Um, we didn't. Uh, we always shoot the fireworks off from the same corn row path at Mooseheart. And uh, Melrose, our pyrotechnics company, sets up in exactly the same place. But again, the wind carried the fireworks away further. And so if it looked like we were shooting them in a different place, that's not the case. In terms of the amount spent, we spend the same amount of fire on fireworks every year. And so um, some people commented on the grand finale. They didn't think that it was as spectacular as other years. Um, and again, there's, you can't please everyone. Honestly, um, you know, we do our best um, in terms of getting the biggest bang for our buck. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that the fireworks, considering the fireworks are all supported by um, private donations, whether it's individuals or uh, companies in the Fox Valley, um, you know, we raise an awful lot of money to put on a really good fireworks show. And I think that we pulled it off again. So um, I'm very proud of what we did. Um, and our committee of 10 invites anyone who is interested to join. Um, we'll be starting up our meetings again in August to recap what happened last night. And again, we thank you for coming out. Thank you. Any other comments on the fireworks? Alderman Callahan? No, I didn't have on the fireworks. Oh. But the complaints last year with that wind were then that the smoke was unbearable and the music was too loud so it was a it was a vice versa from last year <laughs> well the one thing i would note about it is is that i was with uh, chairman davis out there last night about five o'clock and there was one horrific storm right on i-88 between sterling rock falls and dixon and that that baby was it was red on the radar and it was you know if you know how the crow flies that is due west of Batavia. When you're in Dixon, you are due west of Batavia. And it, they had quite a volume of rain out there. And when the storm watching it, when it got to Rochelle at Route 39, it suddenly all just disappeared off the radar screen. And I guess there was some comment by one of the meteorologists on TV. I didn't hear it, but I was told he said it, that the, the wind that was the easterly wind that was coming out off Lake Michigan and into our area, probably diffused that whole thing about at that location that it just couldn't, didn't lost all of its moisture and everything else. So had that storm happened here, we would have probably lost the opportunity to do the fireworks last night. But it was just apparently meant to be because it all of a sudden just dissolved it right at Route 39. <coughs> it's like it was a wall there and it just, nothing came east of Route 39. So that. That worked out to the to the best. Uh, tonight, I just want to share with you. Uh, we had I had a guy call me on my cell phone as I'm coming down here, telling me that he has a rain gauge in his house, and on the southeast side of Batavia tonight, he had three quarters of an inch of rain in his rain gauge. Now, I had a, I had a heavy rain at my house when I was getting ready to come down, but when I got in the car, uh, I got was interested as to how our friends at the fireworks committee were gonna take down their banners. And I was wondering how they were doing out there. And I got out there and they're walking around, you know, dry as a bone and saying, well, we're getting them down. And they never had much, I guess they had a few drops, but they didn't have hardly any rain. So then I start looking around the northwest side of Batavia and there was just a few kind of semi wet spots, but there was no, any, anywhere near the three quarters of an inch we had on the southeast side. I don't know, but I didn't get over on the northeast side. But I don't know, Alderman, did you get any rain? Got a lot of rain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you did. And, and, no. and We did. Yeah, you did. But there was parts of Batavia that either got it or didn't get it. So if you hear tomorrow that, boy, did you see that rain last night? I mean, there was some wind damage. We had several had public works call outs for trees that took wires down. And the police, I know, got called to some stuff. So there was some kind of storm damage out there in the community. Uh, going to the mayor's report, I just want to take a moment here and make some observations about what's currently ha happening in the state of Illinois as it applies to this ongoing budget forte that we're going through. And I guess tomorrow we're going to find out the latest version of it because the House of Representatives has to vote whether they still have their veto majority which can override the governor's veto i guess we find that out now that 
as you know, the Senate has already approved, overridden the governor's veto of the budget, and so it's halfway there, and the state representatives still have to vote on it tomorrow. Just from a local perspective, selfishly, I just want to share with you some of the things that seem to be going on in our town as a result of this budget thing. Uh, number one, uh, last night I had the opportunity to talk to a couple, and I had another one call and talk to me today. I am aware of at least four Batavia residents who have now been laid off work as of the 1st of July by the state of Illinois because their departments are not functioning. And uh, a couple of them are Illinois Department of Transportation people. So I guess IDOT is kind of shut down at the moment. And uh, so we do have some of our local residents who are, at least for the moment, temporarily out of work. Uh, this morning, I received a letter from the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency, who is the administrator of our grant to rebuild the water treatment plant, or this, our water treatment plant. And the basic, I should have brought the letter to you, but basically it said, well, with the lack of a budget, we can no longer process any money. So you're, you've still got your grant, and you're going to get your money, but right at the moment, we can't pay you anymore. So that's an interesting little sidebar. Then, uh, as most of you know, I, I, have, I guess I would tell you I'm a friend with the Illinois Department of Transportation Secretary, and I work with him in Chicago. With, and so he was telling me that this thing about July 1st was going to have to happen. They were going to shut down IDOT. Well, as you know, we have a project going on the southwest side of Batavia to deal with the uncombining of the sanitary and the storm sewer system. And some of that work is, is, we've been careful to budget it, but we're doing some of it right now. Right now we're on Elm Street. And we're going, if you get down Elm Street today, there's a big sewer pipe laying there. <coughs> and we're getting ready to uncombine at least the beginning portion of that, which will, I think, bring a lot of good relief to some folks down there who are really problemed by this. But one of the things that we were faced with is, is that in the Illinois Department of Transportation budget for projects that have been approved this year. We've got two of them in Batavia. One of them is North Washington Avenue from Wilson Street up to Main Street in St. Charles. That whole stretch of Route 25 is going to be resurfaced. And I think I mentioned last time they're going to put ramps on all the crosswalks in, the, in every street corner. So that job is kind of laying in the limbo at the moment until this budget thing is resolved. And the other one, more interestingly, is on Elm Street over there, in anticipation that we wanted to get the job done before the state came along, because they've got a proposal to resurface South Batavia Avenue from Main Street in Batavia down to Maple Avenue in North Aurora. And that's in the projects for this year. And so Public Works, I think, with good foresight on their part, <coughs> and I'll give Gary home and Scott Haynes and all those involved in this discussion uh, of some real credit, they made the decision that where the new st uh, storm sewer is going to cross Batavia Avenue, we went ahead and put that in, and that's why in front of the cemetery, or the cemetery, well, down at the cemetery to the south and at the funeral home to the north, there's been flashing signs there saying road narrowed to one lane, and we were doing that work. And well, I think we got it done. I'm, I think that's now installed. We got that in with the idea that when they come along and want to resurface 31, they can just put the new road right on top of <coughs> our new storm sewer, and we won't have to think about going back in there and tearing a brand new road up to put a storm sewer in. Right? A great planning on our part. But now, I think we have to sit here and ask ourselves, if this budget doesn't go through, we may be down there doing some temporary hole filling it Elm Street and Batavia Avenue, because that baby is pretty well tore up. I was down there this afternoon and looked at it, and you know it's got some temporary patch in it, but we may have to more temporarily patch it if, in fact, we don't get the two-thirds majority or whatever it is to override the governor's veto in the House tomorrow. <coughs> so I just share that with you all because you're here to represent the community, and we do have a few things kind of in the pan, so to speak, that are frying. And whether or not we're going to be able to serve them up to the public in the next few weeks, 
is greatly dependent on what happens with this budget. And if we turn it down tomorrow and we go back to square one, then I guess the state of Illinois stands here and stands still and quag quagmire and doesn't do anything. And I think there will be some other issues that will start to get in our face pretty quickly because, uh, you know, we've, we've just got a lot of different stuff that there is this interdependency between the cities and the suburbs. The other thing that came came out today, and, and Laura and I have been talking about it, I called the executive director of the Mayor's Caucus this afternoon, and he, he confirmed it with me. And one of the early uh, proposals to deal with the budget, they decided to take away 10% of the local government distributing fund from the cities as a part of their cut. Well, I guess those in power didn't think that was too good of an idea, so they restored the 10%, but to make it work for whomever, uh, now instead of getting that 10% or the, this year's local government distributing fund in, they send it to us, I believe, on a one, once a month payment. Now this year, they're going to send it to us in 14 payments. We're gonna, we've made a new year in Illinois this year. Instead of having 12 months, we're going to have 14 months somehow. Now, I, I assume there's going to be two months that we'll get a double payment, but we're not sure how that, but by spreading this out, it, it has the same impact supposedly on the state budget as a 10% budget cut because you're not sending all this money at one time and, and they can live with it. Now, I think it's sometime that will catch up to them, but it's kind of a mismatch of, of money laundering, I guess, is the way I guess I would describe it. <laughs> But uh, we are, we're, we're going to have to live with all that. So, I mean, every day seems to be yet a new answer or a new idea or a new adventure as to what we are doing with this state budget. But, you know, uh, I will tell you, I'm not <coughs> trying to pat us on the back here, but I, you know, I go to Chicago and talk to a lot of other our mayors in this region. There's a lot of towns that are really in some serious trouble at the moment because of this whole situation and how, how all this is coming together and funding things that they had lined up for themselves. So I don't know where this is all going, but you know, if they don't do that budget tomorrow, I think we're just we're gonna be in for a, a pretty rapid response of bad news stories of things that are gonna be happening in the region that are gonna have a very negative impact. But of course, then the other argument on the other side of that is we need to tailor our spending and Illinois needs to rein in some of what's going on, but I don't know if we've, I, we don't have, we the city council don't have anything to say about it, but I don't know if the state legislature has been able to come to grips with that idea or not, but uh, this thing tomorrow is going to be quite an interesting vote. I'm told that the reason we didn't vote on it today was they couldn't get all the members of the house back down there till tomorrow, so they just put <laughs> it over a day till they could get everybody in the room to vote. Uh, but it's, we are writing some chapters of Illinois governmental history right now that have never been written before. So this has never been played out in this way, so nobody really knows what happens on Friday if we don't approve <coughs> the budget on Thursday. But so there'll be, you know, there'll be more. And unfortunately, if that's the case, it's going to be some pretty negative stuff. I'm sure that's going to happen. But right now, we do have residents of our town who are not working and apparently are not getting a paycheck because they work for the state of Illinois. So if you run into some of your residents and your wards, you may very well hear that if there's somebody there that's state employed because that's what's going on. So on that good news. Uh, <laughs> I move we adjourn the city council. Second. Second. Move by Alderman Brown, second by Alderman Wood, Savati. Kirk, take a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.